is a CBS News special report. United Flight 232 was bound from Denver to Chicago this afternoon when an engine apparently blew up over Iowa. The explosion knocked out one engine and the plane's hydraulics. No steering, right or left, up or down. It's almost 100% fatal every time it happens. Fitch, a flight instructor, was a passenger on the plane and volunteered his services. He wound up controlling the aircraft by adjusting its speed on a harrowing 44-minute descent to Sioux City. I've got 296 lives on my two hands, literally. And it's the most overwhelming feeling I've ever had in my life. And all I had a chance to do is I just looked up and I said, God, help me get this done. Controllers immediately cleared the airspace. 232 to center maintain uh, flight level 290. I'm over your attention, sir. Stand by, stand by. Seconds later. Center United, uh, 232, we're declaring an emergency here. Declaring emergency. And uh, request uh, landing at the nearest suitable airport. By that time, Haynes knew he was in danger of crashing. Sir, we need the works. Uh, 232, we're just... Uh, was cleared to Sioux City. The plane got over the runway, but just before touchdown, the right wing dropped. Out of 296 aboard, 189 survived. NBC's Robert Hager has more tonight on this crash investigation. Investigators feel they know why 185 of those on board managed to escape this inescapable inferno. This is the seating plan of a DC-10. Preliminary information indicates those who were killed were in these seats, almost all of them in the front and in the rear, while those who survived were sitting here, mostly in the center section. Investigators theorize that this first fireball was less lethal than it appeared. A flash fire from aviation fuel sprayed outside the plane. It was brief, and much of the wreckage may have skidded clear of it. Investigators believe the deaths occurred because the front and rear sections disintegrated during the crash, while the center section, its structure made sounder by joints with the wings, remained intact. The cockpit broke off as one piece, also intact, and the pilots survived. Investigators credit the quick arrival of rescue workers on the scene. down, his nose were up, his wings were level, looked like it was going to be just a fast landing, you know, he'd roll off to the end of the runway to evacuate the aircraft, and I really thought we'd all be home for supper that night, I really didn't think, of course, it doesn't happen in your town, it doesn't happen to you. At the end of the runway, it's just a wide open field. Post. Somewhere around 400 feet above the ground, and we're going so fast, the captain said, pull the power off, meaning, let's get rid of some of the speed, and I said, I can't, that's what's holding your wing up. down at the captain's vertical speed indicator and I saw it at 1800 feet per minute which was intolerable we couldn't hit that hard and in a desperate effort I firewalled both the engine shut both the throttles up, up to full power and the time factor wasn't there for us was just stunned when it hit. I mean, we couldn't believe it. Was, it was like slow motion. The plane was probably going 220 knots. And even if we knew we were gonna, it was going to hit hard. But we expected him to make it. For 30 minutes, I built up inside me this wall saying all these people are going to die. And all of a sudden, they're all going to live. And then think again, suddenly, they're all going to die again. And I just felt like my heart had been ripped out.
dropped out of the sky and hit the ground. I mean, it, it felt like we slammed into the earth. And immediately, I mean, within seconds after the initial impact, I saw flames, I saw smoke, I saw people still strapped in their chairs being thrown around in the cabins, people thrown out of their chairs being thrown around the cabin. And, uh, I mean, within a few seconds, there was a lot of chaos, there was a lot of destruction, and there was probably some death uh, immediately upon that impact. I saw the corn stalks going by Captain Ames' window. And the strangest thought crossed my mind is, my God, they really do grow up that tall in Iowa. And of course, the bad news was that a normal DC-10 captain sits 22 feet in the air. And I know they didn't grow it that tall. So I knew that something bad had probably happened to our undercarriage or our landing gear. I remember tearing of metal. I remember now very loud shrieking engine noise. Noises that that you've never heard before and you hope you never hear again. It was horrendous. The, these strange, shrieking noises. When we went straight ahead for a period of time and then we veered to the right into a soybean field. And uh, it's almost as if somebody had kicked you from behind and you could feel your body, your whole body went forward as if you were going over the top. When we started to go over, uh, I was like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I know this airplane is starting to roll. I felt heat, humidity, and debris. And after that, it was just one of the most, I can't begin to describe in words how violent it was after that. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't smell anything. Nothing was working except my mind. Uh, it was like total body detachment or, or being in a protective cocoon. Um, I then realized that two-thirds of me was suspended in fire, and I felt this is, this is it, this is how I'm going to go, on. this is how I'm going to die. I'll never forget the first survivor I saw was this little kid, uh, maybe 10, 12 years old, and then there was this woman uh, wearing a dress and they were both kind of laying on the field and then they set up. They had been tossed out of the aircraft. And they set up and they got up and they started walking to me. And my first, my first reaction was, didn't somebody tell these people that this airplane was going to crash? I thought these were people out here on the airfield for some kind of a, a field day or a field trip or something. I, because as you watch the airplane crash, you couldn't imagine that anybody lived from that crash. So I thought these people were hit by debris. I couldn't believe it. I, and then behind them, more people begin to set up, and then it, the reality set in that, yeah, these are these are people from the aircraft that are actually sur survived this event, you know, uh, and, are in, and most of them in need of medical care. But still, to this day, it's amazing that anybody survived that crash. One hundred and eleven die, while one hundred and eighty-five survive. The flight took off from Denver and was heading for Chicago. The captain at the controls that day was Al Haynes. We've been flying about an hour. It served us our lunch, and uh, we were just about over, uh, just north of Sioux City, Iowa. And all of a sudden, this, this big explosion took place. It came as a complete shock. There was no warning whatsoever. I thought a bomb had gone off. It was very, very loud. Jan Murray Moore was a flight attendant in the first class cabin. It was very obvious that something was terribly wrong. It was just, um, the plane was shaking after the explosion. You know, we started to porpoise in the sky. The noises were just incredible. I mean, it was obvious that we were in really, really bad trouble. A freak mechanical failure caused the loss of the plane's entire hydraulic system, crucial to the steering of the aircraft. The pilots were left with almost no working controls. By sheer luck, a senior DC-10 training pilot was a passenger on board. Denny Fitch was riding in first class and I was working in first class and so I went to him and I kneeled down very quietly and I told him, I said, 
we've lost all hydraulics. And so I said, would you go back up front, ask the captain if there's anything I can do to assist him on a DC-10 training check airman. Well, of course, as soon as we heard he was back there, he's an instructor. He's very familiar with all the procedures. All the, get him up here right now. I went up to do the throttles, and right before I touched the throttles, I simply said, God, help me get this done. Denny now felt the enormous weight of responsibility for the people on board. I got in position to fly it, and I put my hands back on the two remaining throttles that we were using, and I really felt the shock go through me, and it, it became abundantly clear to me then that, uh, that, dear God, I have 296 lives in my two hands. The DC-10 was rising and falling in the sky while the pilots struggled to keep it level. Al and Denny knew they had to make an emergency landing, and the nearest airport was Sioux City. United 232, have Sioux City. Sir, we have no hydraulic fluid, which means we have no elevator control. Uh, almost done, and very little aileron control. I have serious doubts about making the airport. One of the questions people ask me is, why do you go to Sioux City? And I honestly said, that's where the airplane went. And we just kept it flying until it got there. No one had ever successfully landed a passenger plane without hydraulics before, but Al and Denny had no time to worry about that. You know, if we'd gone off on that tangent about well, people are going to die, we're going to lose people, we might have panicked. And we can't, couldn't afford to do that. You can't think about crashing, you have to think about surviving. There was no more fear. It was that all positive attitude. We were going to get it done. We were going to land it. We're somehow we we're going to make this happen. I didn't think it was going to be pretty, but I thought it would be survivable. I don't know how many minutes it was that we were screaming, brace, brace, keep your heads down, keep your heads down. But it was that was a very, very long period of time. There were lots of tears. And there were lots of prayers. But there was no panic. The DC-10 was descending towards Sioux City Airport at over twice the safe landing speed. We're going way too fast. We have no brakes. How are we going to stop? On the ground, hundreds of firemen and emergency vehicles were ready to respond once the crippled airplane touched down. On board the plane, fear was palpable. It was the most frightened I have ever been in my entire life. was just amazing and it was dirt and smoke and there was a fireball that came through the cabin i can't begin to put into words what the sounds of the middle the tearing the acceleration loads the and like a pencil we just snapped off and the cockpit became a 200 mile an hour ball rolling and the rest of the fuselage went on its back and slid into a cornfield on fire with people in it We came to a stop, and there was a little hole of light, probably about that big. And I can remember crawling for it, and actually came to an opening. We stepped out and um, into that beautiful blue Iowa sky. And I thought I was in heaven. Miraculously, 185 people on board survived the crash. Al Haynes had lost consciousness, and when he awoke in the hospital, he had no idea of what he had been through. TV came on, and here's a picture of the airplane approaching the runway and hitting the runway. And I thought, I asked my wife who that was. It was a terrible crash. Who was that? And she said, it was you. And I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe anybody survived that crash. There was this terrible sounds, tearing of metal, G-loads, this yaw to the right. Simultaneous with that change of direction was this sensation that something was like drop kicking your backside. You could feel yourself coming up and over, head over heels. We ended up in four distinct pieces. 
we landed with the right wing down. The wing ruptured open and 11,000 pounds of kerosene came out and started on fire. The wing that dipped on landing, that was the wing that was always going yeah, down? the right wing, you yeah. know. The damn thing always wanted to go down. The engine itself was totally demolished by the impact because it smashed into the ground once the gear fell. The tail broke off and tumbled down the runway at 200 plus miles an hour with people in it. The airplane was in a cartwheeling motion because the engine on the left wing is now running at maximum power like a pinwheel. It's just causing the, the airplane to rotate because the engine's pushing it around. When the tail broke off, the airplane is much heavier forward, so the airplane is now coming up in the air like a seesaw that somebody got off. The cockpit is getting pointed straight to the earth, and we skip like a pogo stick. The first skip, when I saw the windshield go dark brown and green and I still felt the air conditioning, we were still integral to the aircraft. The stress caused the cockpit to break off like a pencil tip. The main wreckage slammed on its back and slid into a cornfield across an active runway. Burning there. Debris everywhere. What seemed like an eternity it was in fact 30 minutes before we were found. Our engineer, Dudley Dvork, was able to get his hand up through some wreckage and somehow he drew attention to somebody driving by. The guy said, what is this? It's the cockpit, there's four of us in here. The Air National Guard brought a forklift truck with chains and tried to lift it so that the fire rescue people could climb underneath and cut us out of our seats and get us out of there. The cockpit had become so dismembered that it was basically a pile of trash. Whenever they lifted us with change, it compacted us in tighter. We'd scream in pain because it just made it worse, so they'd put you back down and then try to rearrange change. I felt a hand just tap me on the chest. Don't worry, buddy, I got you. You're going to be fine. We got you. And uh, salvation. My wife was home at the time. She's been married to me from the day I started pilot training in the Air Force. Whenever an airplane crash happened anywhere in the world, she would get a phone call from our friends. And the question always was, where's Denny? And this time when the phone call came in, where's Denny? She said, well, hopefully he's on his way home from Denver. Our friend said, oh dear God, Gina, a United DC-10 from Denver to Chicago has just crashed in Sioux City, it's on CNN. And she dropped to her knees in tears. We had friends gather, and basically it was a death watch at the house. And a phone call came in four and a half hours later from the chaplain at Sioux City. And they said, well, he's in intensive care. No, no, you, there's gotta be some mistake. We were told he had a broken arm and skinned up. That's true, he has all those injuries, but we almost lost him last night, and he's not out of the woods yet. And uh, I was on the morphine, and you know, it has a lucid quality. Whenever it wears off, you're lucid for a moment before the next input. She looked at me, and I opened my eyes, and I saw her looking back at me, and, and she said, Hi, I'm here. I love you. We can do this. Not you can do this, you poor slob. We can do this. The soulmate of mine was not going to let me go down. She said, Honey, I need to know two things. And she said, What is it? And I said, Did I make the runway? Because our salvation was at that runway. I had to get this airplane on that runway. That's where the emergency people were. That's where the response capability was. That's where the trained personnel were. It meant everything to me. That runway was absolutely critical. And she said, yes, you made the runway. And with that knowledge, I had hoped that even though as beat up as I was, that everybody else was okay. And my next question was just that, is everybody else okay? And she realized I didn't know the truth. And she started to cry, and I had my answer. And I cried for three days every waking moment. There's 112 people that did not make it that day. Some of them I knew, some I didn't. And I would have traded gladly my life for theirs, because I had the responsibility in my eyes.
they carry black boxes on all airliners and post accident they will get the information extracted from the last 30 minutes from the voice recorder and for the entire flight from the flight data recorder. You're able to load a simulator of the same type aircraft and put in the same circumstances. Okay, now all the hydraulics are gone. Was this back in Denver? This is back in Denver in our training center, yeah. They had a pilot from McDonnell Douglas Corporation, one of their test pilots, and one of United's management DC-10 pilots, Gordy Carter, to see if there's some methodology that can be taught to other pilots should it happen again. They kept trying to do this in the simulator repeatedly, and they always had an unfortunate event. It would crash outside the airport by some distance. They called me after the 28th failure. Gordy was just calling to see how I was doing, how my injuries were coming along. We're in a simulator, we're trying to make this thing happen again, and boy, we just can't get it done. And they shared with me of their technique, and I said, no, 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 try this, do it this way, this way, this way, this way. You have to be more proactive, more responsive. Armed with that, they were able to get it on the ground. It still crashed, but the point was they got it to the airport. And he said, you know, we had 29 opportunities. You only had one. I didn't make a mistake. I didn't do anything wrong. None of us did. All we did as a crew was to try to mitigate one of the worst situations that have ever happened to an airplane, just trying to make it survivable. You think about life, you think about what's important. You, you think about why you lived. If that could happen like that, where do you want to be when it does, if it does? I guarantee you that if you ever find a moment in time where you think your end is near, you will think of the people you love.